absolute blessing. It's been a privilege. Uh, God has graciously granted us five years to share uh, among you. And uh, some of you, uh, all those five years. And so we're so very, very uh, thankful. Um, but life, life is about changes. And that's part of the human condition. Uh, things change. Uh, changes come. Sometimes those changes disrupt us. Sometimes those changes disturb us. And sometimes those changes may even cause us to despair. The reality that life is full of changes has pervaded the human conversation from ages past uh, to the present. In fact, it's been the topic of many a poem and a song. Some of you may remember this song. I won't sing it. <laughs> I'm just going to read a few of the lyrics. But I think many of you will, will find this one familiar. Come gather round people wherever you roam and admit that the waters around you have grown and accept it that soon you'll be drenched to the bone if your time if your time to you is worth saving then you better start swimming or you'll sink like a stone for the times they are a changing come writers and critics who prophesy with your pen and keep your eyes wide the chance won't come again and don't speak too soon for the wheel's still in spin, and there's no telling who that it's naming. For the loser now will be later to win, for the times they are a changing. Bob Dylan wrote those words in 1963, and uh, he reflected that truth of human experience. Life is about changes. We're here at the very last Sunday of the year 2014. In one week, less than one week, we will welcome in, in our uh, calendar, uh, the Roman calendar, uh, the year 2015. I always think that that's kind of silly because the Chinese year is like really way up there. But the reality of it is a new year. A new year is coming. Change. We reflect back on the past year. We look ahead to the new. And the one truth that resonates throughout all is change. Change. The Apostle Paul experienced changes in his life. Just like us in his life, as much as we try, as much as he tried to prevent change, changes came. We can't stop it. Paul, though, in the passage that we're going to look at and reflect upon this morning, I believe shows us some of the wonderful uh, truths of what it meant in his life to have certainty, certainty in the midst of life's changes. You see, Paul had experienced in this passage, we'll read it in just a moment from Philippians chapter 1, Paul had just experienced a, a very drastic change, a change from freedom to imprisonment. He'd experienced a drastic change of prosperity and abundance to now deprivation and poverty. And he was facing a very real change from life to a impending death. Change was pervasive in Paul's life. How did he deal with it? 
He's in the midst of that change now. He's writing these words in Philippians chapter 1 from prison. And the prison that he may, we think he may have been in at this time, was literally a hole in the ground. It was a dry cistern. He dropped in from the top. He is down there. And in the midst of those circumstances, he writes these words. Let's uh, read them together from Philippians chapter 1, verses 3 through 14. Paul says this. We'll read it together. I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Me to feel this way about all of you, since I have you in my heart, for whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in the God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless until the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Now I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. Let's pause and look to the Lord once again as we seek his message for us this morning. Our gracious God and heavenly Father, Lord, we depend upon your promise your promise that you're present with us, Lord Jesus. Your promise that your spirit teaches and guides us with your word. Your promise that you wish to speak your word to us this morning. So we trust you and we believe you and we want to hear your message to each and every one of our hearts this morning. Lord, impart to us the gift that will grant to us even more this day, certainty, certainty in the midst of life's changes. We pray this through your Son, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Paul begins here in this dingy, damp prison. He writes to these beloved fellow believers, I think. Thank my God every time I remember you, always in every prayer for you with joy. What gave Paul certainty in the midst of life's changes? I believe the first gift was a certain joy, a certain joy that came from the gratitude that welled up within him. There's, a, there's a, several special words in these first few verses. Joy. But the joy was not just an emotion. The joy was resonating in Paul's heart because he could sense those Philippian brothers and sisters present with him. He said, every remembrance of you, every time I think of you, I'm filled with joy. Every time I think of you, I pray for you. And he says this, you have been partakers with me. The word partake here is the same word that we uh, have in Carmichael College, the koinonia room, the fellowship of the gospel, the sharing together of the gospel. Paul could sense that and that granted to him a certain joy, even in the midst of all the changes he was experiencing. And he says, always, every time I think of you, every time I think of you, joy, 
floods my heart. You notice Paul's time references here? I love this. He says, from the first day until now. Paul was thinking back. I think he was thinking back to that first moment when he met the believers in Philippi. The first time that he had, you know, he had been called over to Macedonia by the vision, the the Macedonian call, and then he went from Macedonia around to Philippi to share in the, the gospel, met Lydia, and all on the, on the uh, riverside. I think Paul, when he says this, when he writes this, he's thinking back to those very first moments. Brought him joy. You think back to first moments. I think back to first moments. I think back to first moments coming to Handong. I think back to first moments in classes, first meetings of students, first moments, from the very first moment until now. Paul lives fully in the present, even though his present is horrendous. It's terrible conditions. Yet he's living fully in the presence with this gift of certain joy. Uh, We watched a film last night that I highly recommend. It is a film. Those of you who have been in my class know that there's a difference between a movie and a film. A A movie will simply entertain you. It may make you laugh. It may make you cry. It may, you know, give you a little relaxation time. But a film... A film does all of that, plus it makes you think. It makes you think. And the film we watched last night was, I think it's Woody Allen's best film that I have ever, now this may, some of you may debate this, some of you communications majors may debate on this one. (laughs) Um, But I think it's Woody Allen's best film. It's called Midnight in Paris. Midnight in Paris. And the, the, the human question that is being posed by this film is, what's the best time to live in? The main character thinks that the best time was in the 1920s in Paris in the rain. And he's able, on these midnight walks through Paris, to get into this old cab, this old 1920s Peugeot, and be transported back in time. And he meets all these amazing authors and artists, and he's just, it's the best of times. But then he meets a young lady, and he falls in love with her, and she believes that the best of times is Paris 1890. And they go back to Paris 1890 with Gauguin and uh, Degas and all those guys. And (laughs) she wants to stay. Let's not go back. And he says, no, 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 no. The 1920s, that's the golden age. She said, That's my present. It's so boring. She wants to live in a time past. He says, but the 1920s, that's my golden age. I'm from 2010. I don't want to live in the present. When is the best time to live? What does Paul say? Now. Now is the best time. Time. Now is the most important time. The people you are with right now are the most important people. To encourage them and strengthen them and bring joy into their life is the most important task. You see, Paul had wonderful joy granted to him as he thought back to the first days. 
but it's to the first days until now. Until now. So, certainty in the midst of life changes because Paul had received the gift from the Lord Jesus of a certain joy. A certain joy that came through Christ's work in and through Paul, in and through the, the believers that he had served and was among, was present with, their fellowship with him in the ministry of the gospel, and their prayers and his prayers for them. Joy. Joy. Ah, a joy that can only be experienced. It can hardly be expressed. And then Paul says this, verse 6, and I am confident of this. Another English translation says, I'm sure of this. A certainty. I'm sure of this. That he, God himself, who's begun a good work in you, will bring it to completion, will bring it to perfection at the day of Christ Jesus. Notice the time reference again. What brings certainty in the midst of life's changes? A certain hope. A certain hope. You see, a hope that is built upon an assured, an absolutely assured, confident expectation that God is at work here and now and he will continue that work until he brings everything to perfection. It doesn't depend on you. It doesn't depend on me. It doesn't even depend upon our relationship with one another. Now, God uses those relationships. There's no doubt about that. Every moment that he grants us together, God is present and he's using those relationships. But Paul says to his dear believers, I'm confident, I'm certain, I'm sure I have this hope. God's present, he's at work. And he's going to bring it, everything, everything in your life, he's going to bring it to that completion. What is that pinnacle? What is that objective, that goal? Romans chapter 8, Romans chapter 8, verses 28 and 29, where we oftentimes quote these verses in the midst of changes and difficulties, when things are not going right, when things seem to be falling apart, these are the verses we go back to, another certain promise. That God causes all things to work together for good to those who love him, who are called according to his purpose. God calls. He calls you by name. He knows each and every one. You're called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he predestined. This is the completion. This is the culmination. This is the climax. At the day of Christ Jesus, that you might be conformed to the image of his son. He's making you more and more like Jesus through every experience, through every circumstance, through every change. God is in control. He's working a certain hope. No doubt. Absolutely no doubt. That's why, thank you, Mia, that you selected those hymns. Yes, through you, Mia said, that the Lord did. And that's true, but he selected them through Mia. And great is thy faithfulness. You see, where does this come from? Thou, you, Lord, you do not change. My, I change. Every day I change. Okay? Ask my wife. Ask my students. I change. We're up, we're down. We're over here, we're over there. We change. 
but God changes not. And thy presence, thy presence to guide and protect. So Paul had, with that confidence, with that confidence, a certain hope, a certain hope that sustained him through life's changes. And then verse seven, I love this phrase. I really do. I believe over the last five years, I have grown to know the meaning of these words in a deeper way. Paul says, uh, in, a, in the translation that I, that I study in ESV, uh, and it's right for me to feel this way about all of you. Paul's sharing his heart. He's in prison, he's writing, he's sharing his heart. It's right for me to feel this way about all of you because I hold you in my heart. What's sustaining Paul in the midst of these changes? God is my witness how I yearn for all of you with the affection of Christ. It's a certain love, a certain love granted to him by God. It's the love of Christ in him and through him to the Philippian believers. But listen to those words. I hold you in my heart. Now, I was first introduced to that phrase in my readings of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Some of you may have thought, when is he going to get to talk about Dietrich Bonhoeffer? Uh, <laughs> If you've been a student of mine or been around me for any length of time, a week, uh, you usually hear something about Dietrich Bonhoeffer. But this little phrase, I hold you in my heart, I first encountered it reading the letters of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And oh, by the way, if you really want to get to know someone, read their letters. Well, ask them first if it's, if it's okay to read their letters, to read their correspondence. Of course, we're reading Paul's letters right here, right? This is his correspondence. This is his letter to the Philippians. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, when he was in prison for the last over two years of his life, wrote a lot of letters. And there's a wonderful collection. If uh, you haven't encountered it, let me highly recommend it to you, called Letters and Papers from Prison. And it was assembled by Bonhoeffer's uh, best student and TA, Eberhard Betka, and... Uh, the letters of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And one phrase that you read over and over and over again in Bonhoeffer's letters to his family, to Maria von Wiedemeyer, his fiancée, and to his students, and to Eberhard Betka, is this phrase, I hold you in my heart. Bonhoeffer had been taught by his mother that only space separates. Only space separates. He was in prison, Bonhoeffer was, just like Paul was in prison when he wrote this letter. And Bonhoeffer reaches out and he senses and he experiences certainty in the midst of life's changes. He was expecting to get out of prison. He was expecting to be released. He was expecting to be married. That was not God's purpose for him. For on April the 9th of 1945, less than a month before the Allied forces liberated all of the Nazi concentration camps, Dietrich Bonhoeffer was executed at the end of a Nazi noose because of his faithfulness and dedication to the call of Christ in his life. But when he wrote those letters in the midst of prison, over and over again, I hold you in my heart. And I was so touched when I read those letters. I was so touched by the depth of Bonhoeffer's affection for his family, for his students, for his fiancée. But then one day I was reading Philippians, and it's like, have you had this experience before? You're reading a passage of scripture 
and you don't know how many times have you read this passage of Scripture before, right? And all of a sudden, a phrase jumps out at you, and you go, I never saw that before. I never realized it was there. And that's what it was here. Paul says, it's right for me to feel this way about you because I hold you in my heart. And I realized Bonhoeffer knew what Paul was experiencing when he wrote those words. And I, by God's grace, have become more and more the beneficiary of those words over the last five years. A certain love. Because you see, sometimes God's love is a little too abstract, honestly, frankly. When people say, God loves you, sometimes in my humanness, in my fallenness, it's a little too abstract. But when one of God's precious children says, not only God loves you, but I love you. I hold you in my heart. I yearn for you with the affections of Christ. That is sharing fellowship in the body of Christ. And that gives certainty in the midst of life's changes. Space may separate. But Christ is always present. And in him and through him, we partake. We share in one another's lives. So a certain love, a certain joy, a certain hope, a certain love. And now in these last, well, he has this prayer. He has this wonderful prayer because as, he, as he's expressing his love to the Philippians, it overflows in another prayer. This is my prayer, my prayer, that your love may increase more and more. Do you ever get those messages sometimes? Someone sent you that te text message, you know, and it's, I love you. And you want to respond back, I love you more. And then they respond back, but I love you more than more. And all. This is what Paul prays. That your love may abound still more and more. Uh, that you would know, that you would grow in discernment. That you would grow in discernment. He is here in the midst of these awful prison circumstances and his heart of affection is going out for these dear brothers and sisters, his children in the faith. He's praying for them that they would grow and mature in their discernment. And notice he says that you may approve the things that are excellent. Okay, grow in discernment and approve the things that are excellent. That's a lot like what he wrote in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, where he said, prove all things, test all things, question everything, and then hold on to what is good. You may approve what is excellent. You may Lay hold to what is best. See, Paul could be sulking down in this damp, dingy prison, but he's overflowing with joy. He's radiating with hope. He's bursting with love, and it moves him to pray for these dear ones, and he wants them to grow. He wants them to grow in their love, in their service for others, in their discernment, to hold on to what is good. That's his heart, his heart of affection. And finally, he says, I want now, now, but now, I want you to know something. Okay, so what brings certainty? 
in the midst of life's changes, a certain joy, a certain hope, a certain love, and finally, a certain knowledge. A certain knowledge. Look at what Paul says. This is what I know. I know this. I want you to know. Paul knows it. I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me, I'm reading from the English Standard Version now, uh, what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Remember the big change that's come into Paul's life here. The big change is from freedom to imprisonment, from prosperity and abundance to poverty and degradation, desperation. And now he's facing the change from life to death. But he says this, I have a certain knowledge. And I want to impart that knowledge, this truth to you. What's happened to me? The changes that have come in my life have happened to advance the gospel. What are the purposes for all these changes? What are the purposes for some coming and others going? What are the purposes for the changes that occur? For successes and failures. For acceptances into grad school and law school and rejections. What are the purposes for all of this? Paul says it. What's happened to me has served to advance the gospel. He had that certain knowledge. God was at work. What's going on in my life is having an impact on others. God is at work in you and through you. Don't ever doubt that. You are unique. God has a special purpose. He knows you by name. And he's using you and the changes, the difficulties, the struggles of your life to advance the gospel, to advance his purpose. It's become known that my imprisonment is for Christ. I'm here because of the testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ. What's happening in my life is because I'm seeking to respond to the call of God. You are seeking to respond to the call of God in your life. Is that your life? If, if, you, were to, if you were to be asked, what are your life's goals? What, what are, what's your five-year plan? What's your 10-year plan? What are your, object, your life goals, your objectives? If Paul was asked that question, he would say, to do the will of God, whatever it may be, to advance God's purpose on earth. However God calls me, wherever he sends me, with whom he places me. And probably the most important question in that reflection is who? Who is God calling you to serve? Not so much what am I to do or where am I to go, but first and foremostly, who has God called me to serve. And I know the English teachers in our audience will say, Cordell, it's whom. (laughs) Whom has God called me? It's objective, right? So whom has God called me to serve? That's the question. This certain knowledge that gave Paul 
certainty, constancy in the midst of life's changes was not a abstract principle. It was not a theory or uh, a proposition. It's the person of Christ. In each of these dimensions, it's Christ. Look at the passage once again. How many times does Paul mention Jesus Christ? In 11 short verses, how many times does Paul mention? Nearly half of the verses have an explicit reference to Christ. Christ Jesus. Jesus Christ. At the day of Christ Jesus, my imprisonment is for Christ. Over and over again, Paul's life was centered on Christ. Paul's message was focused on Christ. Paul's love was devoted to Christ. And it's because of the very presence of Christ in his life that he has that certain joy, that certain hope, that certain love, that certain knowledge. You see, it all is the reality of the presence of Christ. It doesn't depend upon me, what I do, who I am, where I go. It doesn't depend upon you, what you do, because he is always present. Always present. And he does not change. He does not change. Our life will change. Changes are here. They're coming. They will continue. Okay? So Bob Dylan, in 1963, sang, The Times, They Are A-Changing. This theme, this human theme, is still very present throughout popular music today, contemporary music today. See how uh, well you know your Jason Mraz. How well do you know Jason Mraz? Do you know his song, Quiet? It's on the latest album. Yes. If you don't know this song, Quiet, here's another recommendation for you. See, I've given you some contemporary culture recommendations this morning. You know, Woody Allen, Midnight in Paris, now, Jason Mraz, quiet. Does anybody know it? Not willing to... Enoch, you're not even willing? You don't know it? You don't know it? Ah, you're going to you're gonna have to YouTube it. There's a great video that, you know... Um, I don't know all the lyrics by heart, but it's, it's a song about changes, okay? He, he starts out something like, um, every time I go home... There's another cell phone tower, construction getting louder, paving over yesterday. Um, and uh, what's, it, what's the next line? Something like, um, but we'll try to find what's uh, pretty as our town becomes a city. Um, and then the chorus is, empires rise, empires fall. Will you be my constant through it all? I will hold your hand. And I don't know the next line. And it goes on to say, because everything goes quiet when it's you I'm with. Okay? I think you can sing that song to Jesus. Okay? You can sing that song to Jesus. Okay? Because, okay, universities rise and universities fall. Ministries come and ministries go. People come and people go. Empires rise, empires fall. Will you be 
my constant through it all. I will hold your hand. And you know what's wonderful? Jesus is singing that song to you because he's the one who's saying, I will hold your hand. It's Christ that reaches out to us. It's Jesus who on the water reached down and grasped Peter's hand as he was sinking in the waters. Why was Peter sinking? He looked around to what was changing. The winds howling, the waves billowing. He took his eyes off of Christ and he started to sink. And Jesus reached out his hand, took hold of Peter and lifted him up. That's what Jesus is saying to you, to me, today, right now. Don't live in the past. Rejoice, give thanks, be filled with joy from those first days until now. But receive the gift of certainty in the midst of life's changes. A certain hope, a certain joy, a certain hope, a certain love, and a certain knowledge. God is at work. He reaches out. He's with us. Michael Card says, uh, poses this question. What is God's greatest desire? What is God's greatest desire? That's a tough question. What does God desire the most? When Jesus chose his 12 disciples, Mark chapter 1 tells us, I think it's Mark chapter 1, tells us he chose them so that they might be with him. God's greatest desire is to be with you and for you to be with him. Paul knew that in the prison the very presence of Christ. It's God's greatest desire. In this Christmas season, we celebrate that, right? Emmanuel. Emmanuel. God with us. All the way to the book of Revelation. And God will be and is with his people. No need for a a light in the new Jerusalem. God himself, Christ himself, is the light there, his presence. That, you see, certainty in the midst of life's changes, it's not answered by a, a what. What gives us this? It's not answered by a how. How do we get it? It's answered by a who. The very person of Christ. His presence with you, in you, among you, always. Let's pray.